Hello everybody. Uh, this is uh, the XLIF core um, uh, video presentation. I am going to uh, go ahead and uh, give the demonstration here, or excuse me, the presentation here, uh, and it's going to include some, some demonstrations. So uh, let's get right into it. Uh, this is session three. Uh, some of these slides uh, have been covered in uh, previous sessions. Um, and this is uh, this was an originally an in-class session, but I'm uh, recording this video as a supplement to that in-class section session. Uh, so as usual, uh, we had our quiz earlier. Uh, I have the topics that we're going to cover today: introduction to XLIF and XLIF Core. Uh, hopefully, you were able to do the reading. Uh, hopefully, it wasn't too much reading. And then as a reminder, next week's class will be online. It will be TMX and TBX. And if you could read the uh, highlighted in red portions, uh, that would be good. So uh, preparing for today's exercises, as I said before, it would be a good idea to have uh, a, a good text uh, editor. Uh, these are the ones that I recommend. Uh, and then it would also be good if you were able to become comfortable navigating the command line. And these um, <coughs> excuse me, URLs uh, are good resources for that. So XLIF, uh, let's get right into it. Um, XLIF is the XML localization interchange file format. It's an OASIS open standard. Uh, the URL is there on the screen. It, uh, translation tools use XLIF as their native file format. Uh, translators know and like XLIF. Uh, XLIF 1.2 was passed in uh, February 2008 and XLIF 2.0 was passed uh, August 2014. Uh, while some of the tools ha are lagging behind and don't support XLIF 2.0, uh, we're going to focus uh, this class on XLIF 2.0. So why do we care? Uh, so translation tools use, uh, uh, they can open XLIF as their native file format. There is no file conversion overhead, no overhead for translators to buy and learn proprietary software. So let's think about that for a minute. Um, one of the things that uh, a lot of people do is they say, okay, okay, I want my uh, translations to be done, and they'll send uh, their, um, you know, uh, uh, word processor files or their desktop publishing files uh, over to, or, or data files to the translation service provider, who in turn will need to convert those into XLIF to do the translations, to open them in their uh, computer-aided translation tools, and uh, who also, uh, or the other alternative would be for them to uh, to buy this expensive proprietary software and to learn how to use it and then to do the translations. So that's a, um, a lot of overhead there. So uh, the best practice uh, is to provide XLIF files instead. Oh, and uh, the some formats are exceedingly difficult to translate in their native uh, format, websites, software, graphics. Okay, so introducing XLIF. Uh, the need to provide information to people who speak different languages is an age-old challenge. The evolution of the translation process over the years uh, looks something like this. In the beginning, translations were done by brute force. Uh, over time, successful methods became repeatable processes that could be documented and shared from one group to another. As momentum grew, these processes became ad hoc standards. Uh, but the game changer, the watershed moment, occurred when we recognized that ad hoc standards must evolve into open standards. Uh, that way, um, you don't have to communicate the method uh, between the two parties involved. Uh, you have an open standard that everybody understands, nobody owns, uh, and everybody can use. It makes it more efficient. Uh, so the impact of, of XLIF. Once XLIF and its fellow translation standards became open standards, uh, tools, translators, content management systems, and translation customers could exchange translation workflows in a predictable way. As other XML-based open standards arrived, such as DITA, SVG, DocBook, and HTML, it became possible to automate these translations using standard tools. So one of the things that we talk about a lot is the so-called XLIF round trip. So uh, since I'll be using that term a lot, why don't I go ahead and define what that consists of. So with the XLIF round trip, you start off with a source file in a source language, for example, Microsoft Word in English. You transform that source file into it in the XLIF format. That, uh, then the third step is to translate the XLIF to the target language, and then you transform the XLIF back to the source language format. So for our simple example that we're talking about here, what would result would be a Chinese Microsoft Word file. 
Of course, that's a very simple translation. The more complex translations uh, involve uh, uh, would, would be more compelling examples. So to put that graphically, what we're talking about is the classic extract and merge paradigm, which is an established model for efficient trans translation. So let's uh, look at the left-hand side there. Uh, the source document website or software is extracted. Uh, we extract the localizable text and format information into a single XLIF file. We open the XLIF file with our translation tool. The translators, the human translators, translate the text. They may leverage uh, translation memory, uh, TMX files or TDX files. They save the translated uh, text into the XLIF format using their computer-aided translation tools. At that point, we have a bilingual XLIF file which we can convert back into its original format, which might be a document, a website, or software, or whatever. Uh, so the translation model is that we isolate the translatable text into translation units. We have a source and a target. The source is for the translator to understand what needs to be translated, and the target is the area with the, where the translator will put the translation. We retain the source document's structure either internally or externally uh, via the skeleton uh, file, or we do it internally uh, with group elements. So uh, let's look at this example. This is an InDesign file. So uh, the InDesign file has a heading and some paragraphs and some a bulleted list and so forth. Um, from there, we can use that tool to export a simple vanilla XML file. Uh, in this case, we have the, uh, the same uh, file represented as XML. We transform the XML to XLIF. So now we have uh, the same um, XML file from the InDesign file, but now it's in a format that the translators can natively edit. Uh, so the translator opens it with their computer-aided translation tool, and then when they press the Translate button, uh, they can do several things. They can leverage translation memory, or they can get uh, a TBX file, uh, or they can do the translation. So in this particular uh, screenshot, we see that the uh, source is presented in one pane, and then the target where the translators need to do their translation is shown in another pane. So then uh, at, after that is completed, we have a translated XLIF file that has the source strings still in English, but the target strings, or the target text, in this case in German. We transform that back into XML, so now we have the simple InDesign flavor XML file, but now it's German. We import that back into InDesign, and we have uh, the German file uh, in the Word, excuse me, in the desktop publishing uh, software and format. So it would be reasonable for people to ask a, a few questions. And when I say the uninitiated, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I just mean people who haven't uh, been living with this stuff and haven't thought about it much. So it would be reasonable to ask, why not just hand the translator the InDesign file to translate? Uh, OK, but why not then just translate, hand the translator the XML file to translate? Uh, how do people transform uh, a file into and out of XLIF Okay, I kind of get that, but uh, with simple docu documents that you just showed, but what about complex things like websites, software, graphics, or videos? So the answer to the frequently asked question, number one, why not just hand the translator the InDesign file to translate? Translators' expertise in tr are in translating, not in operating various software required to process different formats. Processing proprietary formats requires them to purchase and learn a variety of software packages. They will charge you for this. XLIF is a native file format uh, that their computer-aided translation tools can open and process. No processing fee or overhead. OK, then why not just hand the translator the XML file to translate? Well, that's a step better because it takes us out of the expensive uh, and um, uh, steep learning curve software, but they would still need to learn a variety of XML flavors. Uh, XML editing tools are expensive with a steep learning curve. Uh, and again, XLIF is the native file format for uh, their computer-aided translation tools. OK, so then uh, if you're agreeing with uh, frequently uh, uh, answered question number one and frequently answered question number two, frequently asked question number three might be, OK, how do people transform the file into and out of XLIF? So the answer is that some tools have an export to XLIF op option, um, Visual Studio, uh, Drupal, Oxygen, for example. 
Um, nearly all tools, though, can export to XML, so that XML can be round trip transformed with open source utilities. Uh, I have a couple of examples listed there. These are the two open source utilities that I provide to the community. So these can take the XML uh, that you export from those tools and uh, create XLIF files into and out of uh, to do the XLIF round trip that we just talked about. Okay, I kind of get it with simple documents like that, but what about complex things like websites, software, graphics, and videos? So as the complexity increases, so does the technical challenge. Most of the complex things uh, can be exported and Im imported into XML format, um, and this is one of the reasons why we teach this class. So we'll get into how do we tackle those more complex uh, formats. So basically, I'm going to show you exactly how it works, and, and this may be kind of repeating, but I want to make it conceptually clear uh, exactly what's going on. So the source file is the file that you want to translate into another language. In this example, we have a very simple Microsoft Word file that has a, a heading and two paragraphs. Uh, so the way that works is that each XLIF file has uh, a root, XLIF root as its root element. So we have a start tag and an end tag, and then the content to be translated goes in between. The next step is that for each source file, it needs to have a file element. So the file element is nested one layer uh, inside the XLIF file, and the, con the translated content goes into the middle. So the next step would be to segment the source. So in this case, we're saying that the heading is one segment, the, second, the first paragraph is the second segment, and the third paragraph is the third segment. So then we have a tool or a human being that would take those segments and put them into the XLIF file. In this case, we have segment one, segment two, and segment three as the content that needs to be translated into that XLIF file. From there, uh, we would open the XLIF file in our computer-aided translation tool. We would do the translation and uh, then uh, each uh, of the translations that we did in our tool would end up in the target elements in the XLIF file. So in this case, we see targets for the heading, the first paragraph, and the second paragraph. Uh, so then the target file would be transformed from XLIF back into its source file. And in this case, we have a Microsoft Word file that has the German. OK, so that's basically how it works. Uh, as I said before, uh, there's a version called XLIF 1.2 and a version called XLIF 2.0. We will be focusing on XLIF 2.0 in this class. Uh, the neat features about in XLIF 2.0 that distinguish it from XLIF 1.2, uh, we have a modular approach now. So the fundamental translation features in XLIF are in the XLIF core, which is what this class is about. The advanced translation features are in XLIF modules, and those will be covered in a future uh, class. Uh, and then there are also conformance requirements. Any tool that claims to support XLIF uh, needs to be able to handle XLIF files con containing only core elements and attributes. That's a minimum uh, entry level for uh, compliance uh, for XLIF 2.0. So XLIF core includes support for preserving document structure, marking up text for translation, uh, translation metadata, segmentation, and subflows, annotations and bidirectional text, uh, fragment identification, and extensibility. So we'll cover those things in this class. So preserving a document's structure um, provides a way for uh, us to perform that round trip. There are two methods that we can use. There's the minimalist method, which means we put all of the information for uh, performing the round trip, the metadata, into the skeleton element. Or there's the maximalist method, which uh, preserves all of the information for, for performing the round trip in the group elements within the translation area of the XLIF file. So I'll show you each. So let's consider that we're starting with this source file. This is a very simple XML file. We uh, could do the minimalist method by putting everything that is the formatting information into the skeleton file and then leaving the uh, segments and the units very simple with just uh, the source elements and after we do the translation the target elements would be added. Contrasting that with the maximalist method, now this isn't a very complex file so it doesn't really uh, isn't a real compelling example but I think you can get the idea. Uh, what you see there is the group element then uh, holds the structural and hierarchical information and then the um, each of the units has the name of the element uh, and we kind of uh, the complexity into 
uh, the actual translation area of the XLIF file. Uh, so let's go into the features uh, of XLIF. Um, uh, marking up uh, trans text for translation. XLIF provides way ways for marking up the uh, text for translation through the use of elements. Um, there are container elements, source and target, or there are inline elements, and there's a whole list of them there and the different uh, reasons that you would use one over the other. So I'll illustrate some of those here. So uh, let's start off with this well-formed inline text. Uh, this is a paragraph tag uh, that has an inline element, uh, a bold tag uh, around the, the phrase skiing. Um, so for this, we would use uh, a source uh, wrapper to wrap the entire segment, the entire sentence in this case, and then a PC element, uh, which would uh, uh, then uh, represent the, um, the inline element of uh, bold in that case. Uh, in some cases, you can't use a simple PC element. Uh, for example, sometimes you have malformed text and you still have to translate it. So you can't really fix the text uh, because that would uh, break it for the import in the, uh, the, the downstream tool that will be consuming this uh, text. So in this case, it's malformed because we start our bold tag and then start our uh, italics tag. And then we end our bold tag before we end the italics tag. So we can't have uh, proper nesting. So in this case, we have to, have to use the SC, which is a start code, and an EC, which is an end code. And the ID and the ref uh, attributes let us know uh, which is associated with the other. Okay. Uh, translation metadata. So you can add metadata as XML attributes or as content in XML elements. Uh, the translation metadata allows you to add information about the content being translated and about the translation workflow. Uh, for, so examples of metadata in attributes, in this case we're saying that this XLIF file's source language is English and its target language is German. An example of metadata in elements, uh, in this case we have a note that says be sure to use the guitars.tmx file for translation memory. This is a note to the translator. This is not something that we want to have translated. It's just metadata about the workflow. Uh, segmentation and subflows. Segmentation can split a portion of translatable text into smaller segments to optimize uh, size and delineation or to optimize the use of translation memory. Segmentation can be used to reorder segments. Segmentation is usually automated but often needs to be adjusted by human translators. Subflows are pieces of text not part of the normal flow of text in the document being translated, like bookmarks or mouse over text. So here are some examples. Um, let's uh, show an example of segmentation to reorder um, some segments. So in this case, we start with English. English is our target language. And in this silly example, uh, Yoda English will be our uh, target language. So English is our source language. Yoda English is our target language. So in this document, uh, we have a unit who has uh, segments in uh, top-down order that say, you have become powerful. I sense in you the dark side. So that's how we would say it in English. But in order to make it Yoda English, we would then have to reorder these segments. So we've done a translation. In this case, we've just really changed the uh, upper class and lower class, excuse me, uppercase and lowercase um, um, in the uh, spelling, uh, but this is to mimic a translation. The other thing we've done is we've used the order attribute on the target elements to show the new order so that the when the uh, this text is processed back into its format, uh, the order will be correct. So now if we look at the order elements, we start with number one, number two, number three, and number four. The new order is powerful, you have become the dark side I sense in you. Kind of a fun example. Uh, so annotations and bi-directional text. Annotations are useful for translators to know specific details about the text that they are annotating. Uh, the XLIF provides standardized ways to do this. Uh, the first one that I'll show you is the translate annotation. So in this case, we're indicating that a span of text is not to be translated. So if we look at the source element to be translated, it says the phrase Guten Morgen means good morning. Uh, but we don't want the uh, 
the literal uh, translation to be translated again. So we put an MRK uh, element uh, around that span of text and we've set translate to no. The second example is a term annotation. In this case, we identify a word or phrase as a term. So it's useful to note that the, uh, the MRK element that's highlighted on this slide is part of core, but it's being used in concert with something that's in an Excellent module. So in this case, we say, I need a new pick before I begin to play. If somebody doesn't know the context of that, they may pick the wrong word for pick. They may translate like the instrument, excuse me, you know, the, the tool that uh, you would use in a, in a gold mine for picking gold, uh, or you might um, uh, pick the word for toothpick or whatever. In this case, we've uh, said that the uh, type of annotation is term. Uh, that's unfortunate that I have translate equals no there. That's not really part of this example, but it refers to uh, a glossary reference. So then if I go back into the glossary element there, I see that there's a, a term called pick, and I see that its definition is a small, thin device of plastic or metal used to pluck a stringed instrument. So now, as a translator, I know the context, and I'm able to pick the right the correct uh, uh, translation. So comment annotations are uh, a way of uh, making sure that the translator uh, is even further, has, has even further clarification. In this case, we have a note uh, that says, in many cases, practice is better translated from rehearse using the German word for that. So then I've, uh, in the source, I've put a MRK element, type equals comment, and a reference back to that note. Actually, the reference should be N1, not note one. And in that case, the translator has uh, further direction on how to best translate this term. Okay, so then there's the case of bidirectional text. Bidirectional text is when we have uh, the majority of the document, in this case we'll say is left to right, but there's a particular string that needs to be read right to left. So sometimes we need to annotate that. So in our source, we say, the note said, hello, friend, and then we have the literal Arabic, which is then given the DIR attribute of R2L, which is right to left, uh, in Arabic. Okay? So uh, fragment identification. Um, because uh, XLIF IDs are not required to be unique, there can be an, it can be ambiguous as to which ID you are referencing. So either external tools or even internal tools, uh, excuse me, internal within the XLIF file can use this fragment identification methodism uh, method that is identified and um, specified in the XLIF specification uh, to do the, the uh, fragment identification. Extensibility. Uh, extensibility in XLIF means to add functionality not already in the XLIF specification. In XLIF, uh, uh, in in XLIF 2.0, you can do this in three ways. You can add elements from a custom namespace, you can add attributes from a custom namespace, or you can use met the metadata uh, element module. And we'll go into that a little bit more next time. Um, <coughs> extensibility conformance requirements uh, require that extensibility must be used only to perform tasks that are not otherwise supported in the specification. So that's the slides. I kind of went through them uh, quickly. Uh, but then I would also like to, as part of this, um, go over the uh, um, X marker tool uh, that we'll be using for our projects. So if you go to D2L and you go into the resources directory, resource files directory, if you are in Windows, you would pick the X marker setup exe. If you are in Mac, you would pick the XMarker uh, DMG, and you would download that software, and you would put that into your, uh, you would install that onto your computer, and then use that uh, software uh, to, um, to, to do the uh, uh, projects that we need to do. So uh, I've already done that. I've installed the software. So I'm just going to go through uh, how that works. So I'm starting it. In my case, I'm using uh, um, Windows for this demonstration. Uh, so uh, we have the software here. The next thing that I would ask you to do is to download the XMarker files. So I'm going to download that. 
and I'm going to put it in my ET directory uh, that we created from uh, last time. And I'm going to just put that right in the root of the ET directory. And I'm going to save it there. OK, so then I'm going to open my ET directory. Um, best way, easiest way for me to do that is just show it in Finder. OK, so I've opened my ET directory on my desktop. And I'm just going to extract it right here. Okay. And that will give me practice files. Uh, the software comes with practice files, but the thing I've found is, is if I uh, overwrite the practice files, um, then sometimes they uh, uh, don't work the next time for the kind of exercise I want to do. The other thing to know is that you have this in directory and this in keep directory. You can replace the files in the in directory with the files in the in keep directory uh, to start over from a, a fresh start. So I'm just going to demonstrate some of the functionality of this uh, software. So I would encourage you to please uh, pause the video now, uh, download the software from D2L, and install it, and then um, start the software. Uh, also download the uh, XMarker files and put those in your ET directory. Uh, and then when you complete that, please uh, restart the video and I'll show you uh, how the software works. Uh, and uh, the, one of the things that I would say is that if you find any bugs, uh, for example, we found that some of the uh, directional screens on the Mac computers in the Mac lab at Portland State University uh, didn't uh, show the text correctly. That's a bug that I will fix. Um, but if you encounter any bugs, please let me know, and I will fix those bugs uh, so that we have a, a better software package. So after you've completed that, uh, please restart the video. OK, welcome back. So uh, you are hopefully in the same state uh, that I'm in now with your software uh, fully functioning. So I'm going to uh, show you exactly how uh, we do this. Uh, I'm going to start off with the scenario that we have an XML file that we need to convert to XLIF. So to do that, the first thing I need to do is to uh, pick the set XML file. I'm going to go into my uh, XMarker files, and I'm going to go into my in directory, and I'm going to pick, uh, actually, I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to um, do it the way I showed you. So we're going to go into the desktop, and then I'm going to go into my ET directory, going to go into my XMarker files directory, and I'm going to go into my in directory, or I could call these folders. I'm going to set this from uh, to all files, and then I'm going to pick the simple.xml file. I'm going to open it, and it shows in this uh, window here. I can zoom in, and I can see that this is a, a sample XML file, just a garden variety XML file. It's not XLIF yet that I uh, downloaded from um, w3schools.com. And it's uh, basically a breakfast menu. So I'm going to set that as my XML input. OK, so now it says file is set as uh, XML file. And if I go to my XML file tab, I can see, and I'll zoom in a little bit here, I can see that I have this XML file. I do not yet have an XLIF file to translate. So I'm going to go into my XMarkers Utilities uh, uh, area here, and I'm going to say convert XML to XLIF. So I'm uh, clicking that button, and sure enough, it took that uh, XLIF, or excuse me, that XML file, and it, it turned it into an XLIF file. And we can also see that it used the um, uh, maximalist method because I see group elements uh, that preserve the hierarchy. So I'm going to hit my move to source. So what that does is that it moves the uh, XLIF file into our translation pane here. Okay, so hopefully you were able to do that. So now, I'm, and, and the other thing to notice is that uh, I was wrong. This is actually the minimalist method because I've got my skeleton here that has all of the uh, hierarchical information, and then I have a very clean uh, experience for translating the uh, the segments. So the, now that I've got an XLIF file, I'm going to um, do. Uh, 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 Translation. So I'm going to go into my translation area here and click Translate. And I'm going to see that the first string that uh, I need to translate is Belgian waffles. So I'm going to translate that into my new language called gibberish. 
Okay, so that's the, the translation into the language gibberish. You can see it's very co complex there. Uh, I'm just making this up. So then my next segment uh, will be the price. I might change this into euros or something. I'm going to change it to uh, gibberish price. Um, okay, and next will be, uh, I'll need to ch uh, translate this string. So I'm going to uh, translate that again into gibberish. And I'm just going to go that far and I'll say done. And it says to o overwrite this. So now you can see in the XLIF file that it's actually done my translations. I see that uh, my first uh, translation of Belgian waffles is translated into gibberish, and my price is translated into gibberish, and my third string here is translated into gibberish. So I can save that file, uh, and I can I can move on. So I'll save the uh, XLIF file uh, into this directory here on my desktop. Et, and I'll call it uh, uh, menu. Dot xlf, and I'll just save it there. So that's basically how this tool works. Uh, hopefully, you're able to use this tool. Hopefully, it'll work nicely for you. Um, as we go further into the project that you'll be doing, we'll be making use of other things. I will show you how to set the translation memory and how to uh, use that, how to set the terms, how to use that, uh, but that will be all for a class uh, in the future. So hopefully this was useful for you. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Uh, that will conclude our uh, uh, tape for today. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.